think uh, Bao sent out a little message in the chat that we are going to be recording. So uh, welcome everyone to tonight's edition of the Sustainable Food Systems Lecture Series. Um, this is brought to you by the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Maryland College Park. My name is Meredith Epstein. I am a senior lecturer and advisor in sustainable agriculture at UMD. Uh, I teach in a program called the Institute of Applied Agriculture. It is a two-year certificate program, uh, transcripted academic credit, that trains uh, people in the technical communication and business skills of having a successful agricultural enterprise. And this lecture tonight is actually being hosted by an undergraduate course that I teach. And I wanna give a shout out to my students for opening what is now their virtual classroom to the public. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers and our topic of this evening. Uh, but first, a quick uh, few words of thanks. I want to give a big shout out to our support from Information and Education Technology Office, um, namely Brad Peleg and Bao Nian, who are shepherding us tonight um, through the technology, and our communications team that is led by Graham Binder. Uh, the entire lecture series is sponsored by one of our college's five strategic initiative teams. Uh, this one aims to establish a healthy food system and ensure global food and nutritional security. That team is led by Lisa Lackenmeyer and Dr. Rohan Tikakar. And all of this work happens under the leadership of our Dean, Craig Beirudi. So we are just thrilled that amidst all of the canceled events of late, that a program like this lecture series can still happen. And tonight, we are joined by a panel of military veterans turned farmers and food entrepreneurs. And one of them is actually an alum of the Institute of Applied Agriculture, but I'll let him tell you about that. I am going to start things off by introducing our moderator for the evening, and then she will introduce each of the four wonderful panelists that we have and then lead a discussion. A couple of quick housekeeping notes first. Uh, like I said, this event is being recorded, so it will be available later on our website um, if you would like to view it or share it with anyone else. And uh, we are going to hold all questions for the end. So if you do have a question to ask, please enter it in the chat box function of Zoom, and I will be keeping an eye out for it and make sure that um, it is asked. So Sarah Dacius is our moderator this evening. She is the deputy director for the Farmer Veteran Coalition, which is a national organization that helps veterans transition into the agricultural sector. In that capacity, she works with veteran farmers all across the country, builds relationships with partner organizations, and engages with our government agencies in DC to ensure our farmers are supported. She's an urban beekeeper who manages hives throughout the city and volunteers at a DC farm which produces food for the local community. She has a professional science master's in urban agriculture and sustainability from the University of District of Columbia's College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Science. Sarah is a military veteran having served in the US Navy for over 20 years. So thank you so much, Sarah, for bringing together our panelists this evening, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Meredith. And thank you very much for allowing our farmer veterans to have this platform this evening. One of the greatest gifts we can give our, our farmer veterans, I think, is a chance to share their stories, um, to let their voices be heard. And so we appreciate your support on making that happen. And then also to all of those who are participating in this webinar this evening, thank you so much for joining us and for signing on. Um, as Meredith said, I'm the Deputy Director of Farmer Veteran Coalition, which is a national nonprofit, um, which cultivates really a new generation of farmers and food leaders and develops viable employment and meaningful careers through the collaboration of farming and military communities. We do this essentially in three concrete ways. One, we have an annual farmer fellowship fund, which is a program that grants up to $5,000 to farmers for equipment to support their operations. 
We are currently in the process of reviewing 453 applicants or applications, which is the highest number of applicants we've ever had. And we've raised a lot of money for it and we're still raising more money because we want to give as much as many grants as we possibly can. And in fact, today, Giving Tuesday Now, we're fundraising just specifically for the fellowship fund um, so we can increase the number of rewardees. If you feel so inspired after this evening of hearing our farmer veteran stories, please go to our Giving Tuesday Now GoFundMe. It's on our webpage, farmvetco.org, um, to donate. Every cent you donate will go to the, fel the fellowship fund. And I will tell you that there are some panelists on um, tonight who have applied for that fellowship fund. I will not name who, but keep you wondering. Um, so the second thing we do is we have membership discounts. So if you're a member, which is absolutely free to be a member, we have discounts with various agricultural vendors for seeds, for uh, percentages off tractors and other equipment, for beekeeping equipment. Um, and we have a very strong relationship with Farm Credit who loves to help veterans get loans um, and work one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with veterans on their farm loans. So. Um, that's another one of our, our, our benefits. Um, Homegrown by Heroes, which is a signature initiative of, um, of ours that enables veterans to have a separate look at markets with branding that says you are a veteran. So in a market where consumers are really focused on supporting veterans, Homegrown by Heroes is a great way to showcase that you are one. Um, we have 2,000 farmer veterans across 50 states that proudly display the Homegrown by Heroes label. $50 million in aggregate sales last year. We have 20 partnerships with um, Department of Ags all across the country. Um, and we've just launched a website which allows you to search your region for Homegrown by Hero labels or Homegrown by Hero vendors if you're a consumer. Um, but at its core, Farmer Veteran Coalition provides a platform for veterans to support each other. The networks is our strongest benefit. Though not now during COVID-19, we normally do hold and participate in conferences um, on the national, statewide, and community um, level. Um, we also do community-specific conferences like an all-women's conference. Um, we have state chapters. We have 10 state chapters right now, um, and we have three more that will be launched just next week, a week from tomorrow. Um, and if you are in Maryland, we're trying to launch a chapter in Maryland and we have a meeting on Thursday. So if you chat me, I will send you details if you're in Maryland and you'd like to participate in starting a chapter here. Um, and then the last thing is we have education opportunities um, where we um, re-grant money so that veterans can participate in beginner farmers programs that already exist, such as Rodell Institute or Casa Food Shed. They all have beginner farmers programs and we send veterans there so they can do it at, no, at absolute no cost. If you have any questions about Farmer Veteran Coalition, please contact me at Sarah at Farm Vet Co. I'm gonna actually put this in the chat window. Um, if you have questions about the fund, if you have questions about Home Girl by Heroes, if you have questions about becoming a member, um, please let me know and I will um, email you uh, by tomorrow. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our farmer veterans themselves. Um, first, we'll start with Peter Scott, who founded Fields for Valor. Peter, it's all yours. All right. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, here we go. I haven't given this talk on uh, online, but I'm at the farm right now. My name is Peter Scott. Uh, I'm a veteran. I uh, served uh, about 12 years in the U.S. Army as a counterintelligence agent. I uh, got out in 2010, uh, had deployments to Kosovo, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, other places in the Middle East, uh, two tours in Germany. Uh, I got out in 2010. No experience in farming, um, not um, much experience in the civilian world since I joined at the uh, ripe old age of 19. and. Uh, when I got out, I started going to college, University of Maryland, uh, promptly figured that wasn't the thing for me, uh, moved into beer brewing, uh, from there I went to, to culinary school, did cheese making school, made cheese in Ohio, worked as a brewer, worked as a butcher, uh, worked as a baker, uh, started doing charcuterie and keeping bees and gardening, um, and finally my, my time in the service caught up with me. And I ended up taking about a year and a half off 
uh, with the support of my, my wonderful wife, Christine, uh, to do a little soul searching. So fast forward a couple years, 2016, I uh, started Fields Valor Farms. Uh, we're a nonprofit farm, not to be confused with a no-profit farm, which you hear a lot of old folks talk about. Uh, we do it on purpose. And our mission in life is to provide veterans and their families with a free weekly box of uh, vegetables, honey, um, eggs. We just got 70 chickens, meats, and also we're an all-volunteer farm, so all-volunteer organization. So we house a veteran here who was homeless, and we're, we're working our volunteer. This was supposed to be our year of the volunteer. It's not quite working out that way, but we are in production and we uh, sent out our first delivery of uh, seedlings, Victory Garden sets to, uh, to uh, folks through an organization called Serving Together. And we'll have food coming, coming up in production in about three weeks. Was that 10 minutes, Sarah? Yeah, uh, there we go. The space bar didn't work, Brad. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, that's great. Thank you so yeah. much, Peter. Thank you. And Marcus, Marcus Robertson from Woodbox Farm. Marcus. I'm sorry, Marcus. Don't forget to unmute in the lower left-hand corner. Oh, oh. I'm going to unmute you for you then. Sorry. Give me one second. Hold on one second. I apologize. Whoops. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, my apologies. It looks like you got uh, no worries. Thanks a lot, man. Got it. Evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus Robinson. I'm with Woodbox Farm here in Alexandria, Virginia, here on the grounds of the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture. I'm a 12 year Army veteran. I was in logistics, entered in 1990, exited in 2002, and spent a little bit of time wandering around trying to figure out this whole civilian thing. Um, whilst in the midst of that wandering, I stumbled upon Arcadia and it's been a, it's been a journey and a joy. Um, if you don't know what Arcadia's mission is, Arcadia not only runs a veterans farmer training program, which I was in the class of 2017, they have another mission, which is to run a mobile market that goes into some of the underserved communities in, uh, Northwest, Northeast. Southeast and Southwest DC. Um, our mission here at Woodbox Farm is to support Arcadia's mission in doing that. Um, I don't think we have quite yet achieved capacity in doing so because we're still uh, on the on the left hand side of that there learning curve. But going into our third year, we're a lot more confident in our abilities. Um, we're a lot more energetic about what it is that we are doing here and why. Um, we are mess around and we are for profit farm, so we may make some money this year. Um, we also anticipate bringing an intern and can't say quite yet um, what our yield is going to be, but hopefully it'll be productive and we can contribute significantly to Arcadia's operations. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Marcus. That's sure great. Thing. Okay, how about Jeffrey? Let's hear what you have to say about loop closing. Gentlemen, you are efficient and effective. The record <laughs> is on. All right, so I will tell you what loop closing is doing, and then I'll give the background story of how I ended up here. So, loop closing. Uh, first, I'll start with the problem food waste. We spend $11 billion a year hauling it away, away, with devastating consequences, and we only recycle 5% of that food waste we make. So loop closing has a solution for that. To get us to 
And we do that by changing business as usual. So what does that mean? Well, stop hauling food waste. So instead, step one, you place composting machines where trash cans and dumpsters once stood. And in DC, there's $66 million we spend a year hauling it away. That could easily pay for those composting machines and the hundreds of local skilled jobs that would be provided to operate and train for those machines. And then step two, farmers, I hope you guys love this, is that finished compost, instead of your farm delivery vehicles going back to the farm empty, they bring that finished compost back to the farm. So we can feed Marcus's farms, we can feed Pete's farms and, and everyone else's farms. And that way they can regenerate their soils and increase their yields. And, and really for all of us, they're the ones who can then reverse climate change because of this. So in a nutshell, what Loop Closing is trying to do is take what used to be haul and harm and change that paradigm into hire and heal. And I'll get more into that as I go into the pitch deck. And, but first let me switch to a slide. And give you a little more of the background. So for those of you who are interested in following up with us, feel free to shoot me an email. It's down at the bottom of this title slide. And I'm gonna take you on a journey. Okay, this is Ensign Jeffrey Neal back in 1992. Uh, wow, such a young cat. And back then, uh, I was in my first school getting ready to go be a civil engineer corps officer in the Navy. So what does that mean? We're the ones who are taking care of the bases uh, around the world and expeditionary bases as well. So whenever um, Marcus and Pete would come back to the base, I'm the one who would make sure that was operating and, and functioning. Our Miss Sarah would land, I would make sure there's a runway for her. Um, so that got me into the field of solving problems or operation problems at bases and solving our infrastructure problems at bases around the world. And that's got my infrastructure perspective going. So my second duty station, there's a brilliant uh, captain, commanding officer there who pulled us all aside in a special all hands meeting of his wardroom. It's about 24 of us. And he sat us down and gave us a whole lecture about how he's going to increase base security by stopping the hauling of food waste off the base. So fewer contractors come on and off. This is in Japan and there's area where we store munitions and we can't build facilities but we can put composting systems there and there's these big giant drums that you put the food waste and and the yard waste from the base and then it goes through and on the other side you get this thing called compost and it's this, this amazing fertilizer you can put on the soil and it does all these good things and he had it all thought out about how much money it would save in the long run the return on the investment uh, the benefits to the base and then um, like any phenomenal, great uh, military person, he was pulled out of his command early and sent off to a more important job to go to. And then we never heard any more about that plan to green composting to the base in Japan in the 90s. And nothing happened. And I promptly forgot about it as if it went in one ear and went out the other ear and then nothing stuck. Uh, I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't understand the importance of why we would want to do this and the benefits it would make and the difference. So fast forward, um, this person you see here collected a whole bunch of injuries along the way. So we got to a point where I was laid up on the sofa and not able to get up after um, eating a banana peel. And I'm sitting there holding this banana peel and I would have this thought of, wow, it's such a shame we don't compost this and recycle. Oh, well, too bad we don't have the infrastructure. I wish someone would provide it, and I would get up and just throw it in a trash can. Well, like I said, this time I couldn't get off the sofa. I didn't want to lay this icky banana peel on my sofa, and I didn't want to lay it on my carpet. So I'm literally stuck there holding this banana peel and thinking about, well, where does this banana peel really go? What's its journey? What's its life? 
And what does it really do? And that's when I thought about, oh, well, it goes to the landfill. It causes greenhouse gas emissions. And we thought about, well, how does it get there? Well, it's on these big vehicles that are disruptive in the city. And look at that pile behind the vehicle in the picture. It's that spill. You guys all, we all know that spill off the back of a trash truck, right? And that's oh, just, it's not pleasant. And that was just the tip of the iceberg of the problems. Um, it was much later that I started to learn that those vehicles and the incinerators that the food often goes to, they create air pollution. And air pollution is deadlier than car crashes and murders combined. So I just started piecing together more and more of this problem and how prolific it was. And then recently I also learned that not only do we create greenhouse gas emissions from food, but how we handle food waste is the single largest driver of climate change. And if we can fix that, that's the single act we can do, single largest act we can do to reverse climate change. So it got deeper though, as I got deeper into the problem and I started thinking about, well, wait a minute, where are these incinerators? Where are these landfills and, and these other industrial waste facilities? They're not in our affluent neighborhoods. We don't leave them there. We don't cite them there. We cite them in underrepresented communities. That's often rural communities, but it's often poor communities, which are often communities of color. So in DC, if you look at where we have our transfer stations and we have those facilities, that's where the vast majority of our people of color live. And that's the traditional path around the US. So we also have this huge environmental justice problem where there's this inequity. We're not all, all exposed to the same problem, uh, to the same degree. And so as I was sitting on this sofa and started realizing probably about half of what I've just shared, I realized, wait a minute, I'm pointing a finger. Why hasn't someone figured out this infrastructure problem? I realized I got more of these fingers pointing back at me that, wait, you do infrastructure. This is what you do. Why don't you solve it, Jeffrey? So what I started to do was just solve it for myself. I'm in a apartment building without a blade of grass, and it took me a long time to figure out all I had to do was feed my food to the worms. But then I killed them. And so I bought some more worms to show up in the mail. And I killed those. So I was failing miserable at this. Um, I was taught by a teacher of a kindergarten class how to do it, and his class, his kindergarten class was doing just fine. But me, the adult, I couldn't figure this out. So I had to go to a class. Uh, Institute for Local Self-Reliance taught a master composting course. And that's where I cut my teeth on learning the basics of composting. And I thought I was done. I was just going to go home. And they said, no, you have to share with the community what you've learned. Then that was the big game changer for me, is, is once I had to go to the community, people started telling me, oh, I'm so glad you figured this out. I too wanted this infrastructure and businesses started to come to me. And what were they coming to me for? Well, as I mentioned in the spiel where we have dumpsters and trash cans. So if you look in that trash room, there was a dumpster in there at one point. Um, and we took that out, not we, Frostburg State University took that out, put a composting machine. And the idea is that instead of having to buy large swaths of land to put industrial composting or anaerobic digestion facility, we use the existing space that we already have to compost our food waste into machines like this. And we can put them everywhere. They could be at every food service provider and every block and every city and even in every rural area. Um, and that, again, that's paid for by the money that we save by not hauling that food waste. And there's other nooks and crannies. If you see the stairwell landing, that's where we have the worm bin. So I finally learned how to compost with the worms properly and they're still alive. The next part to this solution is closing that ecological loop I spoke about. So the, you see the service vehicle down at the bottom, that Cisco, those go back, not, that one doesn't go straight to the farm, but it goes to the distribution center. It goes back empty. And then from there, the farm delivery vehicles can take the food waste, or excuse me, the compost back to the farm. So again, an underutilized resource that we can use to then bring it back to the farm. This is an example of a farm at Howard University where we've been using the compost, we've been composting on site. And the, I always look at it through the lens of, is this feasible? And so the first thing is one, do you get meaningful diversion? And two, can you afford to do this? And that's what this very busy slide 
is giving some details on. So if you want to geek out with me, do the calculations in engineering, here you go. If you look at the 166,000 tons of food that's generated, uh, food waste that's generated in DC, and you look at that machine behind you, a slightly bigger one, a foot longer, a half a foot wider, that's a 50 ton machine per year. You can have 250,000 tons capacity if you put just one on each block in DC, just one. That machine fits in the footprint of a sofa, a nice large sofa, but a sofa nonetheless, kind of like the one I was laying on when I came up with this epiphany. And so as far as meaningful diversion, we get from that 5% that the status quo was stuck at to that 150% in this case. And so is this economically feasible? Well, let's go to the second to last bullet that $66 million spent in DC, if you use that to pay for these machines, retail price, mind you, not even a bulk discount, it would take two and a half years to pay back that cost. And so if you bump that up, if you instead move that cost to pay for the staff members, for every five one of these systems, you could pay a salary of $100,000 to a staff member. It's a good livable wage. And it's a, it's a skilled job that people will be proud to do is understanding how they're uh, basically saving the world so we can stay on it by putting food waste as a part of our cycle again. Um, so the little tagline at the bottom explains what we've been doing in a lot of other industries. By going small enables us to go big. Um, and so one of the, the analogies I like to give is, I see I'm, I'm over time, so I'll stop here, but way loop closing don't, don't worry about being over time jeffrey ah okay well that's dangerous that's really dangerous <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the analogies we put out is we're in the phase of going from the mainframe computers uh my father was a uh, in dot com before dot com was dot com and he was working on mainframe computers and i remember we bring us in periodically to the office we see these big giant rooms these machines with uh First it was punch cards, then it was big electro magnetic tapes. Um, you had the air conditioning room and it took a lot of space in the building. You had to walk down to the room to do any calculations. And that was mainframe computing. Well, fast forward a few decades, we've drastically increased computing capacity by putting desktop computers in every room and every office and every house. So we can do the same thing with composting. Right now we focus on centralized composting facilities and that's our blinders on. But if we include in the mix distributed model where every block, every food waste generator has a composter on site, we can then drastically increase composting capacity. And what this allows us to do by putting our food waste back into our soil is it takes us from this linear where we economy in where we're extracting or we're exploiting or we're creating a waste at the end and puts us into this circular economy. And that, that circular economy enables us to, let me switch this off. This circular economy I'm talking about, I'm doing all these hand gestures, no one can see me. This circular economy is where we're now regenerating ourselves, our soil, our planet, so we can stay on it. The planet's gonna be fine, it's just, are we gonna be fine on it? And then when you make that circular economy instead of that linear economy, you can be inclusive with it. You can leave people out or you can bring them in. And that's what Loop Closing does, does with our workforce development program. We have on-ramps. We started in Ward 7 and Ward 8, as well as over at Howard University initially, where we provide the on-ramps for people who don't have these skills yet to be a part of this burgeoning, forward-facing uh, future economy. And so that's our big push is let's get to this circular economy. And, and when we make sustainable food, we have to remember to close that loop in that food system and not leave our food system in this linear, straight out, exploitive, extractive system, but circular. Uh, so Sarah, I will uh, yield back the rest of everyone else's time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was very informative. Okay, Bob, how about you? Let's hear your story. Okay, you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, first I want to thank Meredith and the College of Ag and Natural Resources for hosting this panel of dedicated veterans. 
I am a, the graduate of the IAA Sustainable Egg Program, which by the way, um, if you are a veteran and you wanna take the intense two-year program, take it at the IAA, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I graduated from there in the class of 2016 and Meredith was my advisor. My name's Bob Burkowski, I'm an old, Army veteran. Mm -hmm. I first enlisted September of 1978 and if you raise your hands and you know what year that was uh, or you can remember that year I'm proud of you. Um, I spent three years in Germany as a military police on active duty. I came home in December of 81 and joined the National Guard because I had a feeling that uh, things were just going to keep going as they were where I just came from. I stayed in the National Guard until December of 2000 when I retired. Now, while serving in the Guard, uh, I was also a civilian police officer for the University of Maryland at Baltimore, which is downtown Baltimore City. And I retired with 24 years in June of, night, or June of 2007. So we've heard a lot about vets transitioning um, back to civilian life from military life. Uh, in the military, your life is regimented, disciplined, mission focused. Uh, was the same for me coming up from the military and law enforcement veterans are purpose driven during their careers. And for me, uh, retirement finding meant, well, retirement meant finding uh, something new and meaningful. Uh, with a purpose. Uh, so uh, while I was in that uh, time period, I, I had a family. I have a son who uh, was in 4-H, and that's how he and I got into keeping honeybees. We did a lot of other things in 4-H, but we, as a whole club, we did the beekeeping thing. And, and if anybody out there has teenage children, uh, you know, at like age 16, they kind of forget who you, the parent, are. And my son found a pickup truck, gasoline, and girls, and that was the end of that. Plus, he's a firefighter, so that the whole firehouse thing uh, was not as glamorous. Uh, but through beekeeping, we did win uh, awards. I got a blue ribbon at the state fair for, um, uh, how do you say, almost city honey. And my son took the grand prize for agricultural commodities at the Baltimore County 4-H Fair. So we, we had a good time. Uh, after retirement, I took a hiatus. I had to find out who I was. I was in pretty bad shape. Uh, the world was quite black and white to me. And eventually I stumbled across this program in sustainable ag at the uh, University of Maryland College Park. And I give the, the, the staff and the students there a lot of credit for helping me find a way to become a civilian. And it was a really good uh, process for me. Uh, one of the things I looked for or what I wanted to do in retirement was start a smaller and then work to a larger beekeeping. Uh, enterprise and it's been a slow process. Money short. Um, uh, after you get to a certain part after your careers in such high energy, uh, high cost careers, uh, the body kind of says, uh, hold on pal, we're gonna we're gonna change the road here. Uh, so I do a lot of time now is to, I, I try to do as much teaching as I can. I was an instructor in the police department. I was an instructor in, in the military. And I love to get up in front of a crowd of people. And I'm going to take an attempt here. This was a program we did with the uh, Wounded Warrior Project through the Institute of Applied Agriculture. And my guest speaker was Dr. Um, Kirsten Trainer, who is a big time uh, researcher in the beekeeping industry, 
I follow a lot of her writing and at, she spoke at this particular workshop we had. And then she asked me to write, here I am in the classroom. All of these people here are veterans. Fat guy on the left, yep, that's me, don't, don't mind him. Uh, all of the people are veterans and uh, we had a great time. This picture here was opening up the beehives on top of the roof. The bees were not very happy that day. And any of you are out there who know anything about honeybees, when they're not happy, you're not happy. But this was on the roof of the chow hall at uh, College Park. And then here we are uh, at another angle at College Park. That's me in the middle with my hand on top of the hive. Uh, oh, there's that handsome guy, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to post my uh, information here if you want to get a hold of me. I when am I going to stop? This article should be available um, from Meredith. I think I sent it to her, so we'll we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, so at age 60, and being a veteran, I look at ways I can get back to these young people, and you know who you are. Uh, that are coming back from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, wherever. Uh, they have not had, I've hadn't had the same con combat experience as they had. I was a veteran of the Cold War um, and it was cold. Uh, I love to teach. I want to give these new, these new guys coming into this as much as I can. Um, and so some of the projects that I, I work on is I have, I have a program I do, one day program, which we did for Wounded Warrior Project. It's just a welcome to beekeeping uh, program. I have another program that I do called pollination for uh, field crops, tomatoes, strawberries, apples, and uh, what's the other? oh cucumbers, which are four different groups of cultivars and all of them have four different uh, pollination needs. Uh, and now I'm, work, I'm working on developing a new short course because all the short courses this year got canceled. And I'm also doing a project on soil health and how that affects um, honey and beekeepers. Good soil equals good plants, good plants equals good nectar and pollen, which is good for the honey bees and you get a much nicer um, quality of uh, honey. Uh, some basic questions. I get stung. Pete, you get stung? Shake your head. Yep. Sarah, come on, shake your head. If you're a beekeeper, you get stung. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, I produce honey that is not um, pasteurized like you'll find in the uh, Um, like it's not pasteurized in the supermarkets. So you're getting all the vitamins, the minerals, the pollen, you're getting everything that's healthy in um, unpasteurized honey. Is it going to crystallize? Yeah, well, you know, you can melt it down and it'll be just fine. Uh, but um, if you're going to get good, healthy honey, uh, get it from a, a, a local beekeeper. They say, that if you get honey from a local beekeeper, the bits of pollen that's in the honey um, helps you with your um, seasonal allergies. And uh, this was the first year I got killed when the maples and the oaks bloomed and I just got hammered. I'm like, holy cow, what is that? It was bad this year, but it was dry and, and warm. So uh, what else? I also know how to make raise my own queens. I've done that. Uh, if you've ever seen a kid in biology class doing an experiment, it was quite funny. Uh, but it, I like that stuff. It was really cool. Um, and I can't think of anything else. I appreciate your time. Appreciate y'all showing up tonight. And uh, take it away, Sarah. Okay. Thank you so much, Bob. It's so great to listen to a fellow beekeeper. And I, I was Sunday, an hour and a half beekeeping, and I thought, oh, I'm, I can't believe I haven't gotten stung yet. As soon as that thought went through my head. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Thank you all four of you for sharing your stories.
Um, and I have a few questions um, that I wanna ask first and then we'll open it up to the rest of the audience. So the first question I want to um, ask, and I wanna start with Marcus, is what are the main challenges you have as a veteran farmer? Or really, what are the main challenges you have be becoming a veteran farmer? That I am uh, approaching a, a, a full-time vocation part part time. I work as well. My partner and I, we both work full time jobs. We both have full time lives, and we're trying to also farm. the The challenge that comes with that is, of course, just time. Um, the next challenge that comes with that is that we're doing it primarily um, by hand. Uh, with you know, with the assistance of Arcadia, we do have access to some of the, 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 the labor saving heavy equipment that they use, but that's by appointment. And if she and I can only get out here on a, on a Monday, Wednesday, and, or Thursday evening, and maybe a Saturday, then we, we have struggled with that. That's just on the, on the, the, the bed prep, that's on the, the preparation for the season, and not even talking about harvesting. Last, on our first year, we had so much produce, but we had no time to harvest it. So, so the majority of it, we, we donated it to Arcadia. Mm. Our second year, we had far less produce, but much better results in terms of revenue, just because we focused on one crop instead of, uh, I think in our first year we did about 19 different uh, crops and that was just way too much. So, you know, we, we're trying to learn balance going into this third year now. So as far as challenges go, time, um, energy, money, um, motivation in some cases, because it can be kind of rough when, you know, you just spend all day working and, you know, you just, you know, been getting your, you know, your, 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 your tush parts handed to you from every which direction. And then it starts raining and it's like, oh man, who's, who's gonna do the greenhouse today? Or, you know, we need to pull weeds or, you know, we definitely need to harvest. It was, um, you know, any one of a number of challenges that you can face in any occupation, multiply times nature. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah, well, challenges that any uh, farmers face. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Marcus. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, you're not done yet. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, Peter, what, can you talk to us about um, which challenges, you, you talked briefly about which challenges um, you faced reentering civilian life, and how, could, could you elaborate on that, and how farming and agriculture helped you to get yeah. over those challenges? Yeah, I think I, think I, I got you. I didn't move a little bit, started raining. You know, so, you know, one of my challenges, obviously, I'm older. Um, that's a general challenge, I think, for older is starting very physical activity or business like farming. Um, but I actually got into farming because of my own mental health. So, you know, I had challenges, PTSD, I spent some time, um, an inpatient program. Uh, just trying to make sense of my service and what I'd done and how it affected me and moral injuries and, um, and guilt and, and all that other things. And, um, you know, it all sort of the ag part started for me with the, with the bees. And I like to tell people that uh, nothing puts you in the present moment like uh, opening a box of uh, 10,000 stinging insects. You know, and it just, it became um, a personal mission in my life um, in order to be able to be, be present for my family and deal with flashbacks uh, and some things. Um, and it's just, it's the grounding activity, you know, connection to the earth, connection to the seasons, to the weather, to the time, to the daylight. You know, farming is, it's, it's a present activity. No matter, it doesn't matter what type of farming you're doing. I mean, if you're sitting in your tractor, with the with the AC and, and the DVD plan, um, you still you still have to watch all that, and you have to be connected. And um, you know, it's turned into a personal connection for me with uh, with lots of other folks and veterans. You know, uh, I'm helping 
hopefully making an impact where they are getting more space and more time to deal with themselves after service and um, and let them find their their bracket that they fit in after after serving time or or serving time or or service <laughs> sometimes it goes hand in hand yeah. yeah absolutely i mean there's so much to that whether it, you're re-entering civilian life after arduous military service or i was sharing with meredith earlier that a friend of mine had a personal tragedy um last week and i went beekeeping on sunday morning and it it healed me to be beekeeping because you're exactly right. There's nothing like being with 60,000 stinging insects to be fully present. <laughs> yeah. And there's nothing morally wrong about providing food for people. Right? Exactly. There's no ambiguity in there, right? You know, whether you're making the compost or teaching people how to do it or doing it for a living or giving it away. I mean, it's, it's good by nature. It's, uh, and you, you can't, uh, you can't pervert that. You can't change that in any way. Uh, in reality or in your mind, I think. Well said, well said. Well, Jeffrey, I've got, I've, um, I wanted to ask you the same question because you don't generally talk about those things. You just launch often right into your composting. But I know there were other things in your life um, before your composting um, revelation. And I wanna know um, what challenges you faced going back into civilian life. And maybe that's why, that's how it led you to composting. Yeah, so Pete, brother, I relate with you starting our activities older. Uh, that's definitely a, a factor. I don't have the, uh, I'm not that youthful photo I showed earlier today. And uh, so that plays a factor. But yeah, I mentioned it earlier about the injuries, the physical injuries I collected along the way. Um, uh, I can't say military service, back on the mental part, I can't say military service has caused my slowness. Like I mentioned earlier, I was slow to learn, learn from my commanding officer in Japan, but that's how I came in the military. I can't blame that on the military. <laughs> but on the physical side, yeah, the collection of the injuries, um, just over time, that got to the point where I was just incapacitated. Like walking to the grocery store was something that I couldn't do without being laid up in pain. And so... Um, I had about eight years of that of, and for me I didn't even know if I'd be able to get back to regular walking let alone the um, athletic activities I like to do whether it's snowboarding or biking or rock climbing like I, I couldn't do any of those things so um, as my my parents were phenomenal they were with me for a lot of that and so they had to deal with grumpy Jeffrey who didn't have that outlet and so now I've, I miraculously have come to the other side um, with a, a lot of help where, yeah, I can walk the grocery store and I'm actually back to the, the pursuits, uh, most of them at least, that I wanted to do and wanted to do in the past. I can ski again or snowboard again. I can hike again. I can bike again. Um, even had the, during that period, wanted to see how far it could go. So I, I was competing in a sport, uh, inline speed skating and had a lot of fun with that. So I am, am very grateful that I've been able to come out to the other side and, and I had a lot of support along the way to do that. Um, and that was uh, in the military support um, with the doctors and the physical therapy and um, the resource, the, v, the VA center. So all those resources that our taxpayers go to, I definitely took advantage of to try and get myself back up and it was a it was a long road so but I'm just stoked I'm there and what I've also learned is that with especially when I was competing with the other speed skaters uh, and I got to learn their stories I started to hear that everyone has had some sort of catastrophic life-altering not sure if we would be able to recover from this moment so while mine came from military service, I don't feel like I'm alone like that. I feel like I'm like every other human I've met and actually got to connect with and to hear their stories. And I'm just amazed at the things that people have overcome to reach the heights and the accomplishments that they've gotten to. And everyone's story is just, I would love to hear everyone's story because it's so inspiring to hear. And we've all had to overcome stuff that we just thought was up. Oh, this is it. Can't go past this. And then had to figure out a way to do it. Um, yeah. Jeffrey, I couldn't agree with you more. 
I mean, maybe it's because we're both old. We've had so many life experiences that we've come to this conclusion. Yeah. But it's true. Everybody has challenges. And if you go into the, you're going in position with engaging with someone, is that, then your compassion for them is so much higher and oh. for yourself. Oh yeah. You know, to, to do what we have to do, whether it's as farmer veterans, farmers, um, whatever challenges we're facing. Yeah. So Bob, that leads me to you. I know you've, you've faced a lot of challenges, which you've, you've shared with us, and we're really appreciative of that. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us about some other veteran agricultural organizations that you've worked with um, or that you think we, we could work with um, um, to help us along our way. I do follow... Oops. Am I... I accidentally muted. I meant to... Um, yes, go. Oh, okay. I do follow online the uh, New York State um, Veterans Agriculture Program, and they have a lot of good information uh, for veterans. Uh, it all, of course, it applies to New York State and, and what they can do, but uh, a lot of it, I find, can be done down here in Maryland as well, Maryland for Mid-Atlantic. Uh, as far as other organizations, uh, I haven't done anything with other um, veterans organizations because they're pretty far and few between. Uh, like we're starting to get this chapter together for Maryland. If there was a chapter in Maryland, we would be able to reach out, I think, to more veterans and, and reach out to um, more veterans families. Mm -hmm. and it's hard. Uh, and I can tell you from being a police officer, and it's hard from being a, uh, a combat soldier talking to family members about what your experiences have been through. So, but in a, gr a group of veterans that we share something in common and, and um, not only our service, but our dedication to agriculture, to each other and, and, and to what we're trying to accomplish. We do have, we do reach out to each other and we take very good care of each other. That's, I'm, I'm so proud of uh, veterans that, that can do that. And there's a lot of veterans in my family. Um, but that's about it. Uh, okay. I, I'd like to see more. Yeah. Um, veterans reach out to Meredith's program and to have somebody there that can deal specifically with veterans. Uh, I know the campus has a uh, veterans group. I was part of that, but everything they had, we had at the IAA, and so I didn't spend much time there. But some uh, uh, to go find the campus counselor for veterans was a journey, and it would be nice to have somebody to just deal with veterans in in agriculture um, because I don't. It, the military hasn't changed since I retired. It's all about the paper, and today it's about the electronic trail. So, uh, and we 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 as a group need that service to be broke down for us, so that we can make more, um, put more time into our education, uh, and then more veteran education. The more we can get um, out there, the better uh, we are, because. The majority of the veterans I taught, or military people I taught throughout my career, um, were all smart people and they caught on quick. Um, of course, when you start, I, I taught a chemical warfare program, so they pretty much didn't know what to think. But I find veterans are, are a unique group of, of men and women who you don't need to, to give them eight hours of a course. Two or three hours is usually enough because that's what our military courses are like. Mm -hmm. And we get it crammed into our brains and, and this is how we learn the best. But I'd like to see more resources as far as cash to veterans. Uh, I know you talk about the Farm Bureau, uh, but getting guys and girls out there that um, can utilize the, uh, the GI bills and, and get them into these programs. Uh, and like I said, the IAA was a great transition from being uh, in a regimented life in law enforcement in the military to um, easing my way around civilians. So there you go. 
Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's nothing like veterans engaging with veterans, just even to get the word out. Okay, I have one last question for Marcus, and then I'm going to open it up um, to our audience. Um, Marcus, can you talk to us a little bit more about the Arcadia program that you participated in to make sure everybody's fully aware of it? Sure. Um, Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture is located here in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm going to see how far I can go with the wireless and try and give you kind of a quick tour. Um, Arcadia has a veterans farmer training component that I was uh, that I participated in in 2017. My partner and I then launched their 2018 incubator, the very first one. Our plots are way back over there. I don't know if you can see Richmond Highway, but that's Richmond Highway, and just to uh, just underneath Richmond Highway is uh, myself and my partner, Brittany Woods Farm. We call it Woodbox Farm. It's a quarter acre. But besides that, there's a production farm. And it is on that production farm that Arcadia grows the food that goes to uh, the mobile market that then goes into DC. Um, this is their greenhouse. Marcus, you, let's see. Marcus, you got muted somehow. While Marcus is, um, is chatting, why doesn't everybody think about some of the questions they want um, to ask? And uh, is he coming back in now? Did I mute myself? Yes, yes. Now you got muted. Just the last few, last 40 seconds, maybe. OK. Uh, I was introducing you to Farmer Kenny here. He's putting in our irrigation. Hey, guys. OK. Uh, good, good enough? Yes, that was great. <clears throat> um, Sarah, would you like me to uh, ask the questions from the chat box? Yes, that would be great. Thank you so much. And thank okay. you, Marcus. Yes, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Sarah for sharing your stories. Um, just as a reminder, we uh, had ask folks if they had questions during the presentations to put them in the chat box so I could queue them up. And I also want to uh, just verbally remind everyone that since we are in this virtual world, um, if you want to applaud for our, for our speakers, you have the reactions feature down on your Zoom toolbar where you can clap or give a thumbs up, which is fun. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I uh, can see numerous people in the audience doing that now. Thank you. All right. So uh, first question comes from Lynn Traversa. She says, you are all to be commended for your commitment to not just one, but two noble professions, military service and farming. It is essential that our youth understand that they can be resilient and overcome challenges. They understand the food system and where their food comes from. So how do you connect with youth to share your story and your expertise? So who, who would like to answer that one? Anyone working with youth? Um, if I'm, I can. I don't directly work with the youth, but that is another part of our Katie's outreach. They do have an educational component where they have a summer camp and they do farm tours and other things specifically for the youth here in the in the area. So this is uh, Jeffrey. Depends how you define the youth. So if it's uh, college age or uh, recently out of high school or just in high school, then yes, we. That's part of our workforce development program. We started with Dreaming Out Loud over in Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, so we work closely with that. And before that, when I was just figuring out the feasibility and doing the, the proof of concept on this, I was partnered with Howard University. And what I started doing was 
every Wednesday I would be at the compost site and I would work certain hours and then people would see me there. And about three months later, people would start to peek their head in and say, Hey, I keep seeing you here. What are you doing? And we start having conversations. And so a lot of the students in the, in the area started to uh, work with the onsite composting that we're experimenting with. This is back four years, five years ago. And then some of them took an interest to it and became leaders for it. And then I turned over operations to a couple of them. Um, and then one of them in particular really ran with it and she became the manager for the site for a year. And then that parlayed into a job for her at the Office of Sustainability at Howard. And then we, that parlayed into a job with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance working in the environmental justice field. So that, that pathway of getting us to opportunities to make a difference in the world at higher and greater levels has been something that has been a joy to be a part of and is pretty much in our DNA of finding ways and paths of continuing to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Meredith, I'll, I'll put a piece in there about that as well, if you don't mind. Go ahead, and then we'll hear from Pete. Okay, got Steph on you, Pete. No, okay. Um, I cut my teeth working with youth uh, as a uh, 4-H leader, which uh, the, the, the parents, the kids, everybody was involved, and we had a lot of great um, young people. Uh, to come out of that that program, uh, but getting parents involved was some of the parents involved was was a little tougher because they had to find the time. Um, but those that kind of engagement and education um, not only spilled out from the 4-H program, but it spilled out into their uh, school days and their college days. Uh, the other side of that is is dealing with the uh, youth in West Baltimore when I was a police officer, um, where I have said and will continue to say that um, we really need to reach out to uh, underserved neighborhoods where kids don't need to the kids don't need to live in the fear they live in. And we need to show them that they got value, uh, and we need to have some education and real leadership. Uh, to reach out to young people to keep them from getting into trouble um, that they that they possibly get in. So it's always been one of my things. Yeah. So uh, Fields Valley Farms, we don't we don't do anything specifically focused at youth or intentionally, but uh, our whole program is designed around a, a family focus. So. Um, in a normal year, we have volunteers and they'll come out and we'll get the kids out. They'll see the chickens, they'll see the bees, they'll go pick a tomato off a vine. Um, but, you know, we're, we're family focused, so we're taking in everyone. So, you know, we get, um, we get feedback sometimes like pictures of kids chowing down on a kale salad or there was one, uh, one, um, one, um, household we were helping last year who was, uh, child had a, a serious illness and the only way she could stomach her medicine was through using our honey. So we ended up giving her five gallons of honey. Um, but no, nothing, nothing specifically focused at kids. So uh, certainly open to it. If people would like to, um, you can reach out to me. I think um, we'll probably get all our information sent out to everyone in the audience. Yes, we'll make sure that anyone who wants to share their info with the audience, we can get that to them. Um, <clears throat> okay, there are two more questions. The next one was from Carol. She said that uh, a lot of you have spoken about how therapeutic farming can be, but at the same time, you've talked about your physical challenges that the military has uh, left you with. Um, and also, it sounds like a generally arduous career. So, uh, what do you think about, sorry, uh, what do you think about, oh, farming being described as therapeutic? I see some who wants I to take that one. <laughs> uh, well, well, farming's different, you know, farming is different from gardening. Gardening's really what kind of got me into it. Um, 
farming, you know, we're trying to produce. We've made promises and it's not just me out in the sunshine with my tinkling my toes in the dirt. Um, so, so it's a challenge, right? Um, but it's the purpose that drives it, the purpose of feeding people. And, you know, especially right now with coronavirus, um, when you look into the farmer circles and you hear people talking like, farmers are serious about producing food for everyone right now. And it's, um, you know, it doesn't matter what creed, race, religion you are or where you are in the world, there, there are farmers everywhere who are, who are digging in and, and giving it more just so that we can provide to the communities. And, and that, that is, gets to the true point of therapy for me. Um, physically, you just got to learn to do it. Uh, I had leaves last year. So, you know, it just, <laughs> you just got to deal with it. Learn how to uh, do more work smart. I think we got the gist of that. You broke up a little bit there toward the end, um, but you're kind of getting toward the uh, work, work smarter, not harder. All right. Uh, can I throw that question out to any of the other panelists? Yeah, I'll, I'll sure. take a swipe at that, being the oldest guy here. Um, I had developed a heart issue. The OR nurse who was a prankster said, yep, that's what happens to you guys about eight years. So learned to deal with that. Had back surgery from disc pounding into my uh, nerve uh, and you just arthritis, you just keep going. Um, military taught me never quit. And if you're enjoying it, you suck it up and you keep on going and and I will say for everybody out there, if you're brave enough, um, these things work great for arthritis, but you just got to take mm. that, that little step to getting stung, but it does work. I haven't done it to my knees, but it does work for my hands. Thank you, Bob. Marcus, I think you were going to speak next. Uh, I was just thinking that the, the therapeutic benefits of just of of sunshine and fresh air and and working with the dirt and nourishing uh and part of me for saying dirt that's how i started when you turn that dirt into soil and that soil into food it's like it's so rewarding that i mean the therapeutic benefits far outweigh uh the being tired that far outweigh you know, just kind of dragging a little bit, or you know, you're in a, you're at the the, the first ten feet of a hundred foot row, and you're looking down like, oh my goodness, and you keep going, and there's this mental toughness, and there's this just this energy that comes from, like Peter said, and from Brett and and Bob and Jeffrey, you know, we're providing a service, and we're still doing service and giving back still. You know, and there, there, there's no way that you can say that that's bad for you. You know, that was it there. Hey, Marcus, I, I love how you were preaching about soil. That's the beauty. Hey, I had to learn from somebody. <laughs> so uh, I'll just say quickly, it's, uh, the question was, if you've got some injuries, how can you do the uh, physical laborers of farming, or in, this, in my case, it's composting. and it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot different than trying to perform at some high athletic endeavor. It's something that pretty much any of us can do. You do it at your own pace. And the last point is that it's, it's funny how our bodies work. If they're built to do work. And if you use it, it responds to that. If you don't use it, you lose it. So um, I'm, now that I've just worked back into, for myself, getting back into shape again, uh, I'm actually in better shape now than I was back in my 20s. I kick my 20 year old, 20 year old butt anytime right now. Fantastic. Um, thank you for those very honest answers. So um, the next question um, is sort of a question slash comment from Ruth, who wants to know if anyone has heard of the 
training program for veterans at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. Um, and she would like to share a little bit about that. So, um, Brad, can we unmute Ruth? Can I unmute Ruth? Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're having trouble. Well, thank you all for your survey. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry. It's saying my. Can you hear me now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, let me get right to it. Um, I just wanted to make everyone aware there's a link for Rodale Institute. If you just Google it um, and under education, um, you'll find the inter information for the training program for VEC. And um, you can apply right now, typically from two to four months, um, and they give you a, a house. Oh, Ruth, we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Um, Ruth, I'm sorry. Um, let me just at least say that Sarah has shared the link to everyone for the Rodale program, and she did mention um, at the beginning that one of the things that Farmer Veteran Coalition is able to do is to sponsor veterans to attend training programs, and they have sent uh, people to the Rodale Institute. Um, okay, great. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, just a little technical difficulty there. Um, but I hope I shared sure. enough. Okay. Um, all right, those were all the questions that people had sent to me or comments. Um, did we have any last questions that folks uh, want to ask live now? I think you did. Give you 30 more awkward seconds. I have a question. Bob, where can we buy some of your honey? Next year when I move. <laughs> 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 I've been in Silver Spring, which is pretty uh, suburban. And uh, I'm waiting to, I'm going to move to the Eastern Shore where I got land and then I'll start um, keeping bees uh, over there. So look for, I'll keep you all, look, I'll keep you all in the loop because I'm going to want your dollars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Except, except, except for Meredith and, you know, she, she gets a little bit of a discount because she was so nice to me when I first started over there. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I cannot thank Sarah and Jeffrey and Marcus and Pete and Bob enough for sharing their evening with us and sharing their stories. Um, I think it's uh, one of the bravest things a person can do is be as vulnerable as you have been um, with a uh, a topic that I know affects you on a, a daily basis and is part of your being and your and, and who you are and the work that you do, which we thank you for. And um, I, I hope it's not getting too old to hear the thank you for your service, all five of you. Um, and I see numerous people applauding that. Uh, and especially in this time of uncertainty and, uh, you know, the health crisis that we're in, I think there's uh, no more important time to be recognized for the work that you're doing in our communities. And I'm just so excited to have heard about the projects that you have going on. And I'm hopeful that uh, some of the folks on the Zoom meeting tonight are going to be inspired and want to connect with you and take help take those projects even further. Uh, Lynn says, farmers are superheroes, and I agree with that. 
Um, so I don't know, Sarah, did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make? I think you were having a little trouble with your audio there. Let's see if we can hear you. Uh-oh, nope. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, we have recorded this, so we will make it available on um, the College of Ag and Natural Resources website where you would have gone to register for the webinar tonight. Um, and uh, you can also reach out to any of the folks tonight who have shared their information um, or to me directly and I can help connect you. Uh, but thank you again to everyone and thank you to our participants for tuning in tonight. I hope that everyone stays safe and stays healthy and stays fed. And uh, I just wanna make a small pitch to join us again next week. This is going to be the last of the Sustainable Food Systems Lecture Series. Uh, next week, our speaker is Allison Jaden from our Department of Dining Services. She's gonna be talking about the topic of food insecurity on our own campus and what is being done to address that and a special spotlight on our campus food pantry program, which um, if you haven't heard, the clientele has nearly quadrupled for that since the beginning of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So another timely topic. And I will look, <clears throat> excuse me, I will look forward to uh, seeing and hearing from you guys then. Thank you.